This is Father Joseph Anthony Cress. And this is Father Patrick Briscoe. And welcome to God's Planning. Thank you for listening. Thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. Uh, if you would like to support us, uh, more information on our Patreon can be found in the show notes or the episode description attached to this episode. This uh, this day on guest splaining, we're happy and excited to welcome Pat Lencioni to our podcast. Uh, Pat, thank you for being with us. Uh, would you take some time and introduce yourself to our listeners? Yeah, so uh, I'm a I'm an I guess it depends how you look at this. I'm an author <laughs> and a consultant and a a speaker around a variety of topics. I'm Catholic, a follower of Jesus. I'm a husband and a dad of four boys. And and years ago, I started an apostolate with another man, John Martin, called um, The Amazing Parish, because I did a lot of work in churches of all, you know, with mm -hmm. evangelical churches and everybody else. And one day I said, why am I not doing more in the Catholic church? And so I started trying to, and then one day I met this guy and we said, we wanna help parishes <laughs> because that's where 99% of people come to know Jesus in the church. And, um, and and parishes could use help so we started the amazing parish that was a little over 10 years ago and we've worked with thousands of parishes and people that work in parishes and most important i'm not a professional in this area i'm a, a person that sat in the pews for my whole life and so i'm now trying to to serve those that serve people like me and that's that's my story well you you kind of undersell yourself in some areas for sure um because the work that you do as an author and with um a consultant bringing that experience into the uh, parochial system with parishes and helping priests to understand the importance of organizational health and how to run a, a parish staff and things like that I, I speak because i'm a big fan and um i have definitely worked with amazing parish and, and adopted a lot into our culture here within this campus ministry and working in that and it's been revolutionary and been so helpful for us to understand that um and so that's why i'm really excited to have you on as a guest because we get to pick your brain and just have this time to like you know really work through all the weeds of this and i think when our uh listeners are starting to hear that okay your experience your past in pulling that into the catholic sector with uh you know the the ministry and the amazing parish but what is it, you know, when we when we see parishes that maybe are struggling, that are not uh, as quote unquote amazing as we'd want them to be, you know, what are some of those signs that like really kind of that you started to see in normal parishes that motivated you to say, listen, we got to change something, we got to do something bigger? Like, what are some of those signs in a parish that that shows its dysfunction or its struggle in that way? You know, there's a few different ways to look at this, but one of the things I always say when I work with a, a parish is. I'll say, what do you think is more important? What you do here or what that big company does over there, that software, I, cause I work with, you know, all these secular companies. What do you think is more important? And they don't automatically go us, but they're, they're like, well, <laughs> I, I guess you'd have to say what we do because ours is people's souls and bringing them to Jesus. And I'm like, yeah, you're totally right. You're more, you're more important than any other organization I work with. Then I say, mm -hmm. and why are your standards lower than theirs? Why do you tolerate things in a mm. parish that a company wouldn't tolerate? And right away, they're like, oh, no, you're right. And so what I would say the biggest sign of problems in our parishes is what I would call, and I use this word intentionally, is mediocrity. Mm -hmm. When we settle for things, and I will tell you, as a, as a lifelong Catholic who's, who tries to center my whole life around Jesus, I grew up pretty much thinking that when things happened in most parishes, it was pretty mediocre and I wasn't really that interested in it. So I'd go to the mass for the sacraments. And by the way, source and summit of our faith, you know, the mass and the Eucharist and the sacraments. Big fans. Without those things, fans. Yeah. that's what matters. But anything beyond that, I would usually go, I don't think it's probably going to be very good. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I hate to say that, but, and people will say, what drives people away from the church or from volunteering more and getting more involved? is people that work in organizations where they're held to very high standards and then they go mm -hmm. to church and things are not striving to be excellent. And that makes excellent people go, oh, this, this just doesn't seem like it's worth my time. And so what I wanna do is raise up the standards, not mm -hmm. because I want them to have pride, but because it is more important than anything else going on. And it's more important than any software program, any chicken sandwich, any, 
healthcare, it's like we're talking about people's souls. So let's do the things we do the very best we can do for Jesus and for the people we're trying to serve. So I would say the, the biggest umbrella is what I would call mediocrity. Mm -hmm. And then everything else is in service of making things excellent. And one of the things that people, I think Catholics run into right away is they say, oh, my, you know, my, my parish is mediocre, you know, and they, they right away, they see the kinds of signs that you're talking about, Pat, but then they, they say, well, but I'm not the priest and only the priest can do something about that. Is that, is that true? Does the whole premise of, of improving a parish, does it all really rest on the priest? Absolutely not. In fact, there's five misconceptions. These are not the dysfunctions, but there's five misconceptions about parish life that we think parishes have to get over. And the first one of those misconceptions is that father has to be involved in everything. And here's the thing. I've never mm -hmm. met a priest who wanted to yep, yep, be. Yep. And yet people go and they go, hey, we should we need to put new flowers in front of the church. Ask father what he wants. And it's like, no, 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 no. No priest said, if you don't ask me, but they'll say, hey, what are your favorite flowers? And he'll say something and they go, okay, let's do that. And he's like, you didn't need to ask me and I wasn't telling you to do that. So we have to realize father does not want to be involved in everything. And that's good. The second one is we can disagree with father. We, no, the, the misconception is, oh, whatever he says is just the way it needs to be. It's okay to say, hey, father, I don't think that's the best idea. Now, we're not talking about the liturgy. We're not talking about the, the magisterium of the faith. We're talking about mm -hmm. whether or not we sing this kind of song or invite people to this kind of program or bring in this speaker. It's like, it's okay to say, hey, Father, I don't think that's going to go well. But so many people in parish go, whatever Father says, we have to do. And it's not, it's not the priests that drive that, mm -hmm. but it's the priests who probably have to demand that people violate these things and say, I need you to disagree. Another one yeah, is yeah. that, no one can ever leave the parish. Like, mm -hmm. oh, we have, if anybody says, well, if I, if you don't do it this way, then I'm going to go to another parish. If no one is ever leaving your parish, then you're not doing something right. Because it's not for everyone. And every parish has a slightly different charism. And I've met these priests mm -hmm. that come mm -hmm. in and they go, well, if those people, they've been here 25 years, they don't really like that kind of music, or they don't like that kind of a talk, or they don't think the church is teaching on this is good. It's like, that's okay. You know, maybe they need yeah. to go somebody else to understand. Maybe they're not suited here just because they've lived in this neighborhood for this many years. Doesn't mean you have to please them. Another one is nothing ever should stop. No ministries should ever end. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, Margaret's yep. had this ministry and there's been four women going to it for the last 20 years and she uses the room. And so we, and it's like, maybe it's time to get Margaret and those other three women in another ministry that's going to bear fruit. But we tend to go, oh, no, nothing. So people say we have 48 ministries and the same 12 people are involved in all of them. And so we can't end any of them, <laughs> you know, and I know you guys are going, oh, you've lived through all of these. The last misconception is that people at our parish don't work on Sundays. Hmm. And I was oh, I'm like, I wait see. a second, wait a second. That's that would be like. And by the way, I'm, I'm all for Sabbath. Yes. If there's one business and it's not a business, it's an organization, it's a mission who needs to be there on Sundays because this is the day it's parishes and you go there and it's like a ghost town. It just father is there. And you're like, mm -hmm. wait, this is the only day that 99% of our parishioners are here and they see no life. And so it's like NFL football teams. If you're, if you work in accounting for the San Francisco 49ers, you're working on Sunday because that's mm -hmm. the day. And if there's ever an organization or a mission that required that, it would be parishes. So those are the five things that, in my experience, you know, father doesn't have to do, be involved in everything. You can disagree with him. It's okay if some people leave. It's okay if you stop and prune a ministry. And it's okay to work on Sunday. So anyway, it's, those are the five misconceptions. It's so important. Yeah, it's so important to be able to recognize that, like, oh, th these are things that are, like, kind of poison to a parish like those yes. five things and you know sometimes you can see a few of them but i we, we laugh and as as you said all that because it's like yeah we've seen this like it, we've lived this whole thing and it really just it's poison it sucks the life out of a parish and i think um you know as as you're going through all five of those i could probably we could probably spend whole episodes on each one of those five yeah. misconceptions but um maybe for the future future series that we do Great. god's playing series uh <laughs> but when you talk about like 
how how do you help people um how do you help people have that kind of conflict well you just hit the right please. word you just said it father and that is let's, it's let's really go with it the mediocrity happens uh -huh. when people refuse to confront things and one another mm. and churches this is the hardest thing i like to say Jesus never said, be nice to your neighbor as yourself. He said, yes. love your neighbor yes. as yourself. And to <laughs> love your priest or a colleague at your parish or a friend, you should challenge them around things that you don't think are right. And so what happens is we go to church and people say, oh, we have to be nice. So no. somebody's rolling out a ministry and it's not, everybody knows it's not very good. But we go, oh, I don't want to tell him or I don't want to tell her that would not be nice. And so we let them do it and it doesn't work. And what's ironic is over time, we resent that person and we start talking mm -hmm. about them in the parking yep. lot. And, you know, depending on what part of the country, you might say things like, she's really not good at her, at her job, bless her heart. You know what I mean? And it's like, <laughs> it's like, no, by not having what I would consider healthy conflict, today's reading was Peter and them confronting like, do they, do the Gentiles have to be circumcised? And it's like, they needed mm -hmm, to have conflict mm -hmm. around that. And and we need to have conflict around uh, at my parish we brought in a, um, a missionary uh, you know we did a mission before easter and it was not good yeah. and all it would have taken is one person to watch that guy's video and mm. say father this is not going to work well but somebody recommended it and somebody didn't say anything and they did it and and the guy came and spoke and did one homily at mass and said so i want you to come for three days this week to my mission and i was like i'm not going to any of them some of my friends went to the first one and said, oh, it was so bad, we left early. <laughs> now, is there any virtue in saying to Father, Father, this guy's not gonna get people's attention. This is not gonna, yeah. nobody's gonna, gonna wanna come. But we do that, we think, oh, well, at least we didn't disagree with Father or get uncomfortable or, so conflict is at the center of this, good, healthy, loving conflict. That's, that's such a struggle. I mean, um, and I've, I've heard from friends of mine that work at different parishes and whatnot. They're like, I just don't feel comfortable like speaking up in a meeting to disagree with the priest and because he's a priest. And like, I wish I could say that everybody has their own opinions, but they're like, I just, you know, to to take that bold step to disagree with the priest is is putting your neck out on the line. And it's like, wow, that sucks if that's the culture that we have to work in. You know, yeah, but you know, I have to tell you guys, necessary. I have to tell you something I'm not proud of, but I swear more when I work with parishes than I do when I work with companies, <laughs> I, not intentionally, not intentionally, but I think it's because I go in there and I'm trying to, and everybody's trying to be nice. And I'm like, crap, this is ridiculous. And, and, and people go, do you talk like that all the time? No, just when I'm in a church, <laughs> I mean, like just when I'm working with you. And I think it's because you, I feel so convicted. And, yeah. and because it's, it's, it's more frustrating when I see a church not do that and what the, mm -hmm. the cost of that is, people wandering right. away from their faith right. life because nobody in the church is willing to say, Father, your talks are too long and, you, and I never can follow them. And I, I'm saying this because I love you and I love Jesus and I love these people out in the pews that want something. You know, and that, that mm -hmm. I just went to like the holy gr or the third rail of this. I mean, that might be the <laughs> hardest one to tell a priest that he has a go, but it would still be an act of love. Let me help you, Father. Let me give you some feedback. Yeah. You know what people Absolutely. say to priests on the way out of church if they didn't think the homily was very good? Thank nice you. homily, Father. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, now I'm questioning every time somebody has said that to me. I'm like, oh no, oh, no. Well, it's true. <laughs> they, that's all they do. That's a, that they think that's the only response is like you said words at the appropriate time, and I have to tell you, like, I got to give you a, a an affirmation there. It's like now oh. you know when they mean it. You know when they yeah, mean it because they said yeah. things like oh, or they'll tell you something about it. And at I think a it's specific good, line. Yeah, I think a good thing for a priest to do when somebody says that, say, hey, what was what was the best part? And they'll go, oh, you know, the, uh, you know, <laughs> it's like the, the end, the, that part where you, <laughs> yeah, the end. <laughs> but, um, so anyway, so I think that whole idea of not being uncomfortable, people think that, mm -hmm. oh, in a parish, you're never uncomfortable. No, Ooh. Jesus made, ma makes us uncomfortable so that we can know the greatest comfort of all. So, yeah, I think as I was listening to you talk about the, you know, the, the, the five misconceptions, 
um, when you when you hit number four, right, which is we we need to we need to be confident that a little pruning is actually going to bear fruit, right? I I think that what what I what was registering there with me, Pat, was the idea that we have to find different people to go to, right? You know, so you're talking there about making the space so that a different crowd can kind of come in. And one of the things that I've noticed is, you know, as you as you say, when you when you have the, when you have the same people, those those people just get worn down. So yes. so how is it that how is it that you that you draw in different leaders? How do you cultivate new new leaders to step up into those roles? Yeah, this the biggest thing is you can't let your staff and this is what happens be protectionist because like yeah. a good person will come and say, I want to do this. I mean, I'll tell you, my wife at a parish we were at did a women's Bible study and it was it was Lisa Brennick Myers walking with purpose and it was fantastic. And more women came to it. and She did it for 10 years. She felt resented by the parish. They didn't come and ask her how it was going. They didn't say, what are you doing well that's working this well? There was this sense mm. of like, well, what is this woman coming in and why are they going to her things? They're not going to ours. And you either go, gosh, let's learn from them and bring them closer to us or mm. let's reject them and secretly hope they don't succeed because it makes me who works here full time look like I'm not doing well. They're not vulnerable and they're not welcoming. I mean, mm. after 10 years, my wife left and she was like, it'd be nice if the priest would have come by and at least talk to us sometimes. Wow. And so, wow. so sometimes what we have is we have careerists that work in a parish and say, mm -hmm. this is a jobs program for me and other people that want to volunteer or do things are threatening my job. Mm -hmm. And like a friend of mine, a Protestant minister once said, nobody should work in a parish because they need the job. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true. It's like, and, and a priest can never have a person that works for them and say, they're not doing a very good job. I should probably let them go or, or manage them so that they opt out or, or get better. And they think, but Shirley has a family and she's worked here for 20 years. And what would she do if she didn't? And this is what they say. And what they're yep, saying is, I, I care more about Shirley's income than I care about the fact that she's driving people away from the from Jesus or, for, or hopefully not that, but our parish. Mm. And so many priests and God bless them. They're like, but what am I going to do? I feel terrible for her. And it's like, well, if she's not succeeding, she's probably not happy in this job anyway, at least confront yeah. her. And, and right, right. there's one thing I want to say, and because this can help, it's like we have this new thing called working genius that, that we're using in the mm -hmm. church. And the working genius tool takes 12 minutes, and it's about discovering your God-given talents. You have people in your parish that are sitting at the front desk that are good at, at paying bills and getting stuff done, and they're not good at greeting people and loving on people that walk in. Change their job. <laughs> Figure that out and, and lean into their genius and say, Shirley, you're kind of grumpy, but I know you love the Lord, and St. Jerome was grumpy too but he was translating the Bible. They didn't make him go out on the streets and meet people because they would have thought Christians were grumpy. So I'm gonna have you do your best not to be grumpy, but we're gonna put somebody else at the front desk who can love on the FedEx guy that comes in and can love on people that come in to look at uh -huh. the church because that's not your gift. But we just go, well, Shirley sat up there for years. I know people think she's grumpy, but what the hell? You know, that's what she does. <laughs> and this, I mean, no company would do that, right? No, that's right. It's, no, that's it's, right. it's not, it, it doesn't make sense. Um... I mean, at Chick-fil-A, if a person didn't know how to greet the customers, they say, hey, go in the back and, and, and peel carrots. We love you. You can be on our team, but we're not going to put you in a job you can't do. Yeah. <laughs> and I think, you know, thinking about the staff and the volunteers and making sure that they they have a le level of kind of like they know their place, they know their role, uh, they, they know that they're seen and loved in, in these aspects is like it makes them – you know, a, a good employee that makes them a good evangelizer and gives a place and a new life um, to the parish and, and the mission of that. And I think one of the other things that you mentioned, um, we're just keep trucking through the uh, five misconceptions here. But that aspect of like, if people aren't leaving, then, you know, is that a problem? And the problem is, because if they're not leaving, the chances are there's probably nobody else coming in either. Uh, and they're not growing. And, and they're not growing. That's it. It's like it's just stagnant in it, the different diseases and poisons that you can see when stagnant water happens is, is never healthy and good. Um, it reminded me that, oh gosh, I think maybe three years ago now, uh, the Vatican put out a new document about evangelizing parishes. And it was a really beautiful document because it talked about how the dynamics of parishes have totally radically changed um, where parish boundaries 
need to exist canonically, but in effect, they don't exist anymore. And to hear the Vatican speak that way, it was really fascinating. Yeah. And I think that speaks to something that you're saying is like, listen, we're very global. We're very mobile now. You don't need to go to the closest parish where you are, but you need to be able to kind of go to the one that is thriving, fruitful, that's feeding you and, and to go where that is. And maybe that means, you know, going down the street or going past a few other churches before you get to the one that that fits. Yes. And 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 that's absolutely true. I'm a big believer now in church shopping or church hopping, but 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 not for the wrong reasons. Some people do it because and, and this in the Protestant world, and I work with so many of my evangelical brothers and sisters, people do it and, and it usually comes down to kind of a not a necessarily but a cult of personality, like that guy's a great preacher. Mm -hmm. And in many of their churches, preaching is like 90% of what happens at their at their services. And so they right. go, who's preaching the best? And so we don't want to get into a consumerism mentality where people go like, because heck, when I was a kid, it would probably be whoever had the shortest mass. <laughs> you know, it's like, get me in and out. <laughs> and um, and then some people go, but, but it, what it should be is, are they on fire and am I being, being drawn closer to Jesus? And my wife and I now choose our parish based on the fact that we feel like the Holy Spirit is at work and people are mm -hmm. are wanting that. And and there are others. Now, the problem in the Catholic Church is I would like to think of a diocese when a, when a church is dwindling, a parish, and it's not because of where they're located, but because people are just opting out. That's when I'd like somebody to go in and say, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes mm -hmm. these days, it's the pastor is his faith isn't very strong or he's very tepid. And mm -hmm. and and the problem for Catholics and I think people listening would know it's like. Yeah, they get everybody gets tolerated. It's like, oh well, that's just him. And I, like, I would that like sucks. there to be like it's problem, but there's no yeah. we're not going to do anything about it. Oh, that's Father Whatever. I don't even want to say a name because I know a priest of every name now. But that's Father <laughs> So and so. Everybody knows he's grumpy or that he doesn't believe in the teachings of the church or that he's kind of been ready to retire for the last and it's like, yeah, that's not okay. Mm -hmm. That's not okay. And 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 people will say, Well, canon law, we can't but somebody could go sit down with them and say, Father, I want, I'm worried about you. Mm -hmm. I don't think you're on fire. And I think that there's some, you might be misleading your people. And, and there's people in the pews that need you to, to show them the way. That's love to ex exhort them to, to rekindle their fire for Jesus. But we go, oh no, that would be uncomfortable. So we just let Father so-and-so sit there and we let the people that work there and that never leave, because there's some parishioners that will only go to the church in their neighborhood. That's just not virtuous. I don't believe mm -hmm. it's virtuous. When you talk so. to people about the reasons why they love a parish, what are some of the top things that you hear? Like what, what draws people in other than having a saint as a pastor? You know, everyone wants John Vianney to be their <laughs> parish priest. Well, maybe don't because saints can be tough. Maybe but, but, you know, yeah. like apart from, apart from the saint, uh, what's in the mix here? You know, I think the number one thing, and I just recently decided this, I mean, I came to this conclusion, and that is you can't have a great parish if you don't have a great church first. A church and a parish are different, I will say, mm -hmm. and a priest right. and a pastor are different. Yes. I will tell you, I go to a church right now that has two fantastic priests, and, and a lot of people are coming there to go to mass and to take part in the sacraments. They have confession before every mass. Mass is said with such reverence. The homilies are preached with passion and love. And so it's a, it is a fantastic church and they are wonderful priests. I will take that. And by now, church, Pat, do you mean, do you, are we talking about the architecture of the building? No, you know, like no, something I mean not the an sacramental or? life. Oh, okay. 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 Well, I don't think they're good at extracurricular, you know, like, like, like programs and, and getting people to go deeper and to, and, and I don't think fellowship is good. And that's because yeah. the parish is not very good. They, they, the priest, the pastor does not like to manage people and he just <laughs> abdicates that. And we're trying to get him to do it. And he's a great guy and he wants to do it, but he's, he's afraid and he's trying to do it. Okay. So, but at least it's a great church. And first and foremost, I want to go to mass and I want to get the sacraments. And I want to know that that priest believes what he's saying and he loves us and he, mm. he wants us to be closer to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. let's start there. What I see okay. is if you don't have a priest that's reverently saying the mass and doesn't deliver a good homily and doesn't have the sacraments and is kind of lukewarm about that, but they're over there trying to build great fellowship programs, that's empty. It has to start with the okay. source and summit of our faith. 
once you have that, then it just seems tragic not to take that into greater fellowship and deeper Bible studies and, and outreach yeah. programs and, and those things. So I don't want people to think that you can manage your way into a great parish if you don't first have a holy church. So when you say, what should the mm -hmm. priest do first? Double down on the reverence, the sacraments, mm -hmm. and the, the supernatural reality of the church, and then build on that into the parish. We at the Amazing Parish, we, we really have three pillars of an Amazing Parish. It goes like this, and this is gonna sound embarrassing. The first one is prayer. <laughs> and people go, prayer, don't you think we know that? But you know what we learned? And you guys are probably, I'm sure not like this because you have a podcast on this, but so many people in parishes don't pray together and they've never prayed with their priest. Mm -hmm. So we would get these staffs together. We'd say, okay, we want you to pray together every day. And, and, and they go, well, we go to mass and they're like, no, 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 no. We want you to pray spontaneously at times with, we want you to get together with your priest and say, what do we, how can we pray for you and with one another? And, and we've had priests say, you know, since I got a seminary, I haven't really done that. Mm -hmm. And, and, and this was far more common yeah, than that, uncommon. that completely tracks. No, no, no. I just want to jump right in uh, on that because I asked, I asked once a philosophy professor who's taught in a number of seminaries across the country. She's a very established, very accomplished woman. I said, what do you think is the number one concern you have that you see in seminary formation? And she said, I don't see evidence of a vibrant spiritual life in our men once they leave the seminary. Oh, yes. And she said, she said, there's something wrong. And so let me tell you, the average Catholic is listening to this and going, you're kidding. They, they assume that their priest is back in the rectory or in the office praying with people all the time. And we would do this and priests would say, I never do. And they love it. Once they start having a real prayer life where people are actually praying for them, where they come and they go, I'm really sad today because this is how I'm feeling. Could you all pray with me? And they get together and they pray together. Priests are like coming alive. The devil must be so mad. And so, so prayer, it starts with prayer. And we, we thought when we started the Amazing Parish, it was going to be all about programs and blah, blah, blah. And it was like, oh no, it's that. <laughs> then after prayer, it's, then it's teamwork. It's like, mm -hmm. you need to know how, and this comes the five dysfunctions of a team. It's like, you have to have meetings and you have to argue and you have to disagree. And then you have to commit and you have to hold each other accountable, just like any other team. Mm -hmm. And so we're teaching them that. And the last one, this is another one that you'll, I think you'll like. And, and I, I can't, I love that Catholics who sit in the pews are going to need to hear this. It's then you need to start evangelizing and you need to start with one another. Do you know how many people work in a parish that never talk to one another about their faith life and they never share books with each other and they never so encourage the, and because they go, well, we need to do evangelization programs. We're going to get this book about how to how, we're going to bring in a speaker. And it's like, no, how about if you evangelize one another for a few months mm -hmm. so you feel comfortable talking about Jesus and people work in a parish go, I do music, I do outreach, I do business, I do this. It's like, no, you're all ministers and you got to minister to one another first. The apostles loved on one another. And, and so when people hear this, Catholics who have never been involved in the church, they're like, they don't pray all the time. And they don't talk about, they're not like recommending books and getting together and doing Bible study with one another. So we introduced this thing in the amazing parish called the three conversations. And it is... Mm. So crazy, because um, we tried to simplify it. We said, get together with the people on your team and then, and then get together with other groups and, and have one meeting and say, can we just um, pray for each other's intentions? And people thought this was radical and they loved it. So we said, just do that. And they go around, what are, you, what are your intentions? Okay, let's pray about that right now. What's your intention? Let's pray about that. Okay, do that. The second conversation is, hey, can you tell me about your journey? Just like how you became like, did your grandma te teach you about Jesus? And then you got to, was it when you were in college? Or was it later? Tell me about your journey. And people had never heard the father priest's journey. They didn't know one another's journeys. And some of them were like, hey, I'm still, I'm struggling with this right now. And, and they just opened it. They said that conversation changed the entire dynamic in our, in our parish office. And the last conversation we said, now get together and just say, hey, what do you do in your role that brings people to Jesus? Mm -hmm. And sometimes the accountant was be like, every single person I, I write a check to, I send them a note and I pray for them or whatever else. And they were like, oh my gosh, we're all ministers. Those three conversations, which were so, so simple, they said changed their entire 
sense of what it meant to work in a parish and eventually to go out to others. So it, it didn't mean that they had to do the Bible in a year, which I love. It didn't mean that they had to go and do spiritual exercises, which is what's wonderful. They had to start by just saying, hey, can I pray for you? Hey, here's how I got to know Jesus. Hey, this is what I do every day. And suddenly the whole place would be on fire. It's, so it's, it's something simple. where like, yeah, those simple things that I think we just assume are taking place in in the church office and in in, but also in the pews like we're talking a lot about you know the staff or the volunteers because we have certain expectations that staff and volunteers are doing these things but this is also the case for you know uh for those that are in line at the coffee and donuts after a sunday mass like you can say that same thing to the person that you're next to it's like hey you know what brings you here like tell me your journey tell me your story and that really starts to like it, it it creates an invitational culture and a culture of you know appropriate uh trust and vulnerability because you start to know the journeys and you start to know how it is that people are living their faith on a daily life that is typically you know done um in in under coverings or behind closed doors but it starts to let that like light of christ really really shine in beautiful ways and build up those relationships so you know to our listeners it's like yeah you may not be on a parish staff or you may not be you know part of the volunteers that's doing this day in and day out but like these are really good questions i think that we can all introduce into a parish life in in appropriate ways because it does it really does open the doors one of my favorite questions to ask anybody and as a chaplain I, you know it just tears down so many walls and, and opens up so many doors it's just that simple text message of how can i pray for you it's just that's the just, number i pray for you i think that we could change the world i, I think every parish should ha- should do, do just that to start they should say mm-hmm. here's our ministry every one in our parish i want you to go out to somebody and ask them Hey, is there something I do this with like the guys who drive me in the car? If I like have a, a, a yeah. Uber driver or something and, and, and it's like, what should I do? How do I say, do you know Jesus? And how about this? It's like, I'll say, Hey buddy, is there something going on in your life? I could pray for you about. And, and 99% of the time, one of two things happens. They say, oh, actually, yeah, my brother-in-law is sick and I'm really, mm-hmm. or some, this is going on in my family and they're so touched. And, and then you can, if you want to be radical, you could say, hey, can I pray right now with you? I mean, that's radical, right? Like, God, help this person. But in some of the cases, they go, no, I don't think so, but but thanks. It's almost never are they going to go, what are you talking about? That's I can't believe you said that. At the very least, they're going to be like, wow, you cared enough about me to ask. Mm-hmm. If that's all we did for a year in our parishes, the world oh. would be on fire oh, yeah. around us. Let's we go. could we could just say every day, go find one person and say, I'd like 100%. to pray for you. What can I do? Yeah. So I think I, I'm, I'm behind you on that. And your I, listeners uh, I, do that in the world. When yes, you're at the coffee yeah. shop, go, Jesus, give me the courage to say, hey, Sandy, you did my coffee. You know, I've been here three times. Is there something going on in your life I could pray for you about? Mm-hmm. Just let's all do that. The world will change. <laughs> there it is. I think that those are our marching orders, and that's the that's the challenge episode challenge uh, for all of our listeners and ourselves included. So, Pat, thank you so much. Uh, it was such a joy to have you and and to spend this time together. Uh, and for all of our listeners, thank you for listening. Uh, please uh, like, subscribe, share uh, all those fun things. Follow us on all of our social media platforms and uh, share this episode with those that you think would be interested or would benefit from it. Um, as we've been talking about, we have upcoming retreats this summer. We have an all comers retreat in uh, Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia in uh, June, and then an upcoming men's retreat in August uh, in Brevard, North Carolina. So for more information on those retreats and other events that we have, uh, check out godsplanning.org. And we have, if you'd like to support us in our uh, in this podcast, please check out uh, our links to our Patreon support that's in the uh, show notes, the descriptions of the videos or whatnot. Um, we'll have more information on Pat's work, uh, his consulting work, as well as the ama- work with Amazing Parish. Those links will be in the description and show notes as well. So thank you all for listening and God bless. Mm-hmm.